This is our logo. Please just take a note of that because you'll see that as we go on and we move on later. And um, what I'm going to cover to today for you is I'm going to talk a bit about the history of the, the calico and textile industry. I'm going to talk about the methods they actually used in terms of bleaching, dyeing and printing. And I'm also going to cover some of the people. And there was an awful lot of people that were actually involved in this. Now, this here is actually a, a timeline of the industries along the River Wandle. And you can actually see textile um, calico printing and dyeing. And now note the dates down the bottom, if you can. Um, you will see that actually dyeing cloth was really taking place from about the middle of the 1500s right through to the 1600s. And it's only when we get to the late 1600s um, and the early 1700s that we really start to see calico printing start to take off in this country. Now, in terms of the river itself, and um, I'm assuming that most of you are familiar with the River Wandle, particularly as uh, Honeywood is right on top of the ponds. But of course, the uh, main source of the River Wandle in Carl Shorten, of course, is Carl Shorten Park itself. Um, but you'll notice the blue dots. The blue dots are, in fact, the sources of the, of the calico works that we had. And there was, there's 19 dots here. It's quite possible, in fact, that there was more than 19. Um, but this is a number that was recorded and recognised by a gentleman called Peter McGow, who passed away in February. He did a lot of research into the mills and the calico works, and he actually came up with 49 mills along the river that he did research on. Now, what was attractive about the River Wandle is it is a chalk stream, flows down from uh, the North Downs, uh, Causton and the Caterham Bournes join at South, Croy at South Croydon, flow up through, through Croydon itself, um, and then came out into what was at one time the only place where you could see it at Wadden Ponds. But a bit later, I'll show you a, a picture that might surprise you as such. Um, but dyes, dyes were natural dyes. This is just a small selection of some of the dyes that you can, you can see. Madder, uh, which is on the top right there, is still grown along the River Wandle today. And in fact, at Dean City Farm, they actually grow it there. And we have Brazil wood that was bought in, and it's known as Brazil wood because it came from Brazil. Um, but these are all natural dyes. Now, whether these affected the river or not, you can, uh, you, you can question. Um, but we saw a change in the 1860s over to chemical dyes. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about those in a moment. But this is a picture of the dye works house at Garrett Lane in Wandsworth. And um, quite a nice picture. Um, dye, dye works, Dye mills were actually also called drug mills um, with the wrong connotations with drugs. Um, that's because of the way they used to grind up the, uh, the wood or the product that they had or the beetle or whatever they were using. But all of those dyes they were actually mixing did get washed into the river as, as well. And you could ask yourself, did that pollute the river? Um, quite possibly it did. There's also a possibility it didn't. Up at uh, Merton Abbey Mills, there are stories um, that have been handed down that actually say sparrows used to go into the river and they used to come out like parrots because they were coloured from the, from the dyes. But the mixing of the dyes was actually quite a job. Um, you know, it wasn't unusual for uh, some of the workers to come out with coloured arms after they'd been working there. Certainly, this is the what is known as the colour house at what is now Merton Abbey Mills um, as well. This is, um, well, the colour house at Merton Abbey Mills would be the inside of this. This is what it would look like. This, in fact, is Morrison Co's works. They were a little bit further up the river. But this is where you would have mixed the dyes. They would have had a book that actually told them from the 1860s exactly how much stuff they needed to put in to actually get the right colour. Um, and they would have added moderates, etc., to actually get those colours as well. Now, the most famous of the dyers, in fact, was the red hats and robes worn by the Roman Catholic cardinals. 
Now, the art of scarlet dyeing here was actually brought and mastered by Huguenots in Wandsworth, which is quite ironic when you think about the, the history of the Huguenots and, and the Roman Catholic Church, particularly in France. Um, the beauty of this was that it didn't, write, didn't run in the rain. Um, now, the two guys who were actually well up on this were a Nicholas Plume, who was, who was registered in 1651. So this is just really before we had the major influx of the Huguenots that I'm talk about in a bit. And an Abraham Herbert in 16, 1654, who was a Dutch Huguenot. Now, the cloth, when it arrived, was calico. This is perhaps you're familiar with calico, but this is calico. This is it, it in its raw state, unbleached and very often not fully processed cotton as such. Now, being that, it actually needed to be bleached. Most of the bleachers initially came from Holland. Uh, a lot of those were actually Dutch Huguenots who moved over to here. And they were actually known as Whitsteads, W-H-I-T-S-T-E-R-S, -E Whitsteads. And there was quite a lot of those along the river. Um, and the way they did it, you actually had bleaching fields. Now those bleaching fields were actually channels cut from the river. And it, the, the cloth itself would have been immersed in the channel along of the water, which had also been mixed with ash and other ingredients. And it would take about two or three weeks to actually get it to look white. Now, this is the actual bleaching fields of Morris and Co. at Merton Abbey, which was a relatively small bleaching fields. Um, and bear in mind that Morris and Co. were a lot later. They came along after eight, eight, towards the uh, back end of the 1800s when Morris actually started looking at the previous and reinventing the old processes that had taken place. Now, a lot of these channels, in fact, were turned over later when they introduced chemical bleaching in the 1860s to actually grow watercress. And watercress was grown in those channels. Now, this, is, this isn't too far from Carl Shorten. This is the Culver's. Culver's Avenue, in fact, goes right through the middle there. And you can just see on the right side there, you can just see the avenue. You can see the Culver's. Now, the Col Culver's, the southern part of the island, where it says the Culver's, that, in fact, was the largest bleaching field in the country, and that covered 55 acres, that covered. So it was a huge, huge expanse of um, bleaching going on there. Now, once bleached, <coughs> we also, we washed the cloth again in, in the river. Um, it could have been just after it's been dyed or it's been printed as well. It would be washed again to, to try and fix it. And um, whether that again polluted the river is up for question. Now, of course, one group that did have a major influence on, on us along the River Wanda, of course, is the Huguenots. As most of you probably aware, they brought they had a lot of skills. Um, Henry VIII, as you know, he was very much into his French for fresh fashion going back into the, the 1500s. Um, now, as you know, over 200,000 of them left, left France, with 50,000 arriving in England. Um, but others also went to Ireland. Um, and you might see, you'll see a bit of a significance of that in a moment when I talk about it. But in terms of the skills they actually brought in terms of printing, they used a thing called block printing. Now, with block printing, this is the type of block you had. Now, in this country, they're roughly about a, a foot square. You also notice that there's little pitch pins on the corner. That's how they lined each block up as they went along for the colouring. Now, each colour you had on a pattern required one block. So if you had 10 colours in the pattern, then you had 10 separate blocks to administer each of the different colours. Now, this is actually a scarf block. And if you notice on the two, two corners on the, on the border, you'll see how one, one bit fits into the other bit. 
And this is a Liberty block. This block is 125 years old. It's in the museum. We're fortunate, very fortunate to have it. But you can see how the integrus of the, the, the metal work that's gone into making that block. And bear in mind, this is only applying one color to that scarf as such. Now, what you had was a block cutter. Now, this is Horace Clark. Horace Clark um, worked at Liberty Print, works at Merton Abbey um, for there. Now, each block, in fact, is made out of fruit wood. And the blocks are actually uh, laid in about four or five layers so they don't actually warp. You look at a lot of wood cuts that you get from artists, they only cut on one layer of wood and then that will cause it to warp over time. But you could actually cut it out of the wood and some were cut just straight out of the wood. Some of the French ones actually use copper put into the block and, and others use metal as you saw with the scarf block. But look at that range of tools that Horace has got behind him absolute mammoth amount of tools that he would have used and it is a job to actually make a block it could take anything if up to three months to actually make a single block and you did have a method of putting the pattern onto the block that was to transfer it off of paper etc etc and um, so it was a quite complex now in terms of the printing it was a two-man job you had what you called the printer, and you also had a tearer. Now, the gentleman on the left is the tearer. What he's actually dealing with is the colour that's going to be put onto the block. So when the dye has been made up, it comes over to him. He then uses a mesh that he rubs backwards and forwards that the printer will then put the block onto and transfer. But you can see how one block, is being used here and how he's using what we call a maul and he uses the hammer of the maul because it weighs um, the equivalent of uh, three bags of sugar, six kilograms as such. And, and they work through that, that area. Now, a lot of the, the, the tearers, which is a French word, we believe, were actually female. And here's a female um, tearer here. This is, in fact, one of the last tearers there was in this country working at David Evans at Crayford. And the last of the calico print works here. Um, it, it closed down after Liberty, as far as I'm aware. Um, but the cloth itself, here is a print room. Cloth itself was three foot by 30 foot, or even in some cases, a hundred foot long. And you would actually go along with your block. And by the time you got to one end, you went back to the other end and you started all over again doing the second block. So you moved across and down as you, as you went. And you can see that over on the far side. And the, the tearer actually looks very relaxed while the uh, printer is actually doing his job. But you can also see here, how they're actually hanging uh, the material as well. Now, this is in the 1929 shop at what is now Merton Abbey Mills, which was the Liberty Print Works. Um, but also look how they keep it um, warm with the, the great pipe that they've got through it as well. Now, this is the blocks. You know, we're talking here about enormous number of blocks. Um, the William Morris pub is the block shop at, at Merton Abbey Mills. Now, I will say something about that. William Morris pub, William Morris wasn't located where Merton Abbey Mills is. He was actually fur, further along the river and um, towards Merton High Street. But we're talking here. These are actually a picture of the blocks at David Evans and at Crayford just before they were sold. And a lot of these blocks were sold. Um, the Americans love them, they buy them. Um, I was saying earlier to Susan and that, that you know, in some cases they were paying as much as £4,000 for a block. Um, all the blocks are numbered, you can see the numbers there. So that's how you know which pattern you're on and what part of the pattern you're actually doing. And it was a very skilled trade. And if you look at this one, this is William Morris. This is his trade pattern. And this used over 30 blocks to actually print it. And you see how, 
how intricate the actual pattern of it is as well on there. I'm just going to show you now some census records, give you a bit of a bit of a, a feel. Um, you notice here you've got John Flint. He's the father in both of these census records. And you notice he's a cal gone from being a calico printer. So printing on cotton here and raw calico where it's been bleached, and bleached white, so they can print on that, to move into printing on silk, being silk printers. Well, you also notice here that the third line on the bottom one in the 1851 census, his son George has joined him. And he's also a, a silk printer. But what's interesting to note on this one is that the three of them, John and George and, their, and John's wife, Sarah, were all born in Ireland. So, you know, you could ask the question, were they Huguenots who went to Ireland and then brought their skills back over to here? Now, what was the reason George joined them? Was that because this is 1851? This is right at the time when we had the potato famine in, in Ireland from, from 1845 to 1852. Well, you also note on this one, on the top it says cottages. So it doesn't really give you a clue where those cottages are. But I can tell you now, those cottages were in the Littler's factory. Now, the Littler's factory was a pre-runner to Liberty Print Works, which is now Merton Abbey Mills. And there was, there was cottages, we believe, on the western bank of, of the River Wandle on the site. So they actually lived on the job. Again, if we look at these couple of census records with the people, again, we start to see where people move. If you look at the top one, Robert Pugh, he's a block cutter. His son, George, another George, is also a block cutter. You look down then, they've got a lodger in this place, uh, which is William Campbell. And they lived on Fitzbridge Road. Fitzbridge Road did have its own calico works, and they had some cottages built there for the calico print workers. And it's quite possible that they, they lived in one of those cottages. But again, make a note here of where they've come from. They've come from Walton Abbey. They've come from Stratford. If you then go down and look at James Burling on, on the next one down, he's got a silk, he's a silk printer. He comes from Stratford as well. His wife was born in Walton Abbey. Quite interesting because that's going towards the East End. Where do Walton Abbey and, and Stratford and that sit on? They sit on the River Lee. So it may well be that a lot of people actually moved over while they initially got their skills over there and may have links with Huguenots. They actually came over and moved over to the River Wandle. Whether they're headhunted or what, we don't know. But certainly these ones appear to stay because most of the children have been, lived, have been born in Mitcham and Merton and such. But also look that James Burling had two sons, James Jr. and William. Both of them are tearers. Now, being tearers at 13 and 15, the chances are they would have actually stepped up. This would have been part of their apprenticeship to learn to be a printer. And they would have they would have learned the trade by being a tearer. And within a couple of years, they probably would have stepped up and became princes themselves. Now, this is uh, another one to look at. Again, you can see what's happening here. Here, Walton Abbey, Stratford again, where we've got a colour maker this time. But interesting here, while that's the head of the family, we've got John, who's a block printer. And there, we've also got a daughter or two daughters, Sarah and Caroline, that are both tearers. Again, 13 and 15. Now, they would have been able to carry on working until they got married. Then they would have had to give the job up or when they hit a certain age, um, and I forget what the age is, I think it's 21, um, where we used to have the old voting right. But again, look where they are, they're Mert Merton Abbey. So they would have been housed somewhere within the site of what was Merton Priory, where there was two Calico works, the Merton Abbey Mills site, and the, the, where William Morris ended up as well. Now this here is Croydon Old Palace. Now, Croydon Old Palace was actually a calico works. In fact, there might have been as many as three calico works in there. There was certainly a lot of bleaching went on at 
Croydon Old Palace. And this is, you can see the list and the number of bleachers there were in that site. You can also see how many calico printers there were and the names of those calico printers. We've got engravers that I haven't talked about yet who were doing copper plate. We've got a cutter to a calico printer um, and a scarlet dyer, which is quite surprising there. But again, he would have been using the natural dyes possibly to, to do that and his skills. Now this is Burton Abbey Mills. Now this is probably the best existing example that we've got left of a calico print works. And you can see there, you can recognize the, uh, let me just put the laser up a minute. Here, we've got the wheelhouse where we have actually just been used for washing the cloth. It wouldn't have been used for anything else. Over here, we've got the block shop, which is the William Morris pub. Here, we've got the 1929 shop, so called because that's when it was built. Originally, only it, it didn't have a second floor. It had two lots of windows, but no floor. Here, we've got the long shop, and this is where a lot of the printing would have taken place. So called because of the length of the cloth that you were actually using. This is the apprentice shop where a lot of the boys would have actually learned their skills as well when they started uh, printing. Now, an apprenticeship for anything, for a block cutter, for a block printer, for a die maker was seven years. And that's where the seven years apprenticeship come from, comes from. Um, this is the coal shop. This is a rather interesting one. This is actually named after another calico printer. Um, I've tried to find out everything I can about Arthur Coles, who, who this shop is named over, but very, very little exists, even though he was a very much, uh, a very late 1800s, early 1900s onwards um, calico printer or textile printer. This is the color shop, color house. It's now a theater. Um, this is, in fact, this goes a long way back. This has got a lot of Saxon stone in it. So it may have been a building there, be, well, well, back to those times. Um, this works was actually established around around about 1753. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about that as we go on in a moment. Now, the other method that they used for printing was copper plate printing. Now, copper plate printing was actually invented by a guy called uh, Francis Nixon with his colleague, Fia Philippus Thompson, um, and they introduced copper plate printing at Duncoran Print Works in Dublin, um, as it says there. Um, uh, eventually brought that over to this country. Um, he obviously came over from Ireland. Um, he was almost more or less headhunted. And I'll say a little bit more about Nixon um, and two of his uh, partners when I get in a moment. Now, the thing is with copper plate printing, it normally only printed one colour, unlike the block printing, and it wasn't unusual, and this may be an example on the right hand side, for a copper plate print to actually then be printed over using blocks, or it may have even been hand coloured in certain parts if it was a small piece of work. So totally different kind of method, but the great thing about it was, it was a lot quicker. Now, nothing was really rosy. Um, there were petitions too, and there was acts of parliament, and I'm not gonna go deep into any of these. Um, in 1696, there was actually a ban on wearing printed calicos. And in 1700, there was a ban in of imported printed fabric. So you couldn't basically get it from France if you wanted to and bring it into the country. Now, a lot of this was due to the woolen industry that felt threatened by <coughs> the calico industry. Now, in 1714, um, there was actually excise duty previously on old reused linens and calico, and that was lifted. Um, in 1790, there was actually a bill to forbid use of printing calicos. Um, and in 1787, 1789, <coughs> excuse me, 1789 and 1794, there was bills about the protection of copyright 
And I'll say a little bit more about that when I get to a chap called William, William Kilburn. So the Huguenot influence is definitely there. Now, this is a document produced by um, Eric Montague. Eric Montague was, loved Mitchum, and he's actually produced 14 books about Mitchum. And this is, this act, all the ones underlined here are actually links to the Calico trade. And you'll notice the first one there is William Asprey. That's Asprey and Co. Limited of New Bond Street. So they actually started off as Calico printers. They are, of course, a Huguenot family. Um, and they had their print works at Fitzbridge. And this is some more of the names. And a couple of these we will we'll look at in a bit more depth. But you can get a good feel here. This is just a Mitchum area. You know, there must have been the same in some of the other areas as well, because we had that 19 different calico works along the river at different times. Now, the first two calico printers that were actually recorded who were Huguenots were John Brigetti and Roland Bouchant. And they were recorded at Wandsworth in 1691. Magretti actually married bon Bonchette's daughter at the time, but they were the two who were actually first recognised. And of course, being French Huguenots, they were actually driven out of the country. Um, and of course, that's where we get our word refugees from. And um, whereas a lot of the Dutch Huguenots that came over, who were, who were in fact within the bleaching area, um, they came over by choice, um, more than likely, more so, more so than the French ones. Um, so moving on now, I'm going to look at some of the people for you. Um, it's very few. You're only going to see a couple of the later pictures um, and one other picture of what these people actually look like. There's very few pictures on some of the names of what the actual people look like. Now, this is uh, Peter and Stephen Mulvillian. Um, Peter was actually born in 1667 uh, and Stephen was his brother. Now, they were successful Huguenot refugees. Now, they opposed some of these acts that were actually put up in Parliament in 1696, in 1714, and 1719 against printed calico. Now, they had works both in Wandsworth and Mitchum, and they employed in both across the two sites roughly about 205 people, which probably doesn't these days sound a lot. Um, but the artwork there, the, the charcoal drawing, in fact, is Ravensbury print works, which was in what is now Ravensbury Park. Um, and that lasted for over 100 years. And the Mulvillians also owned land in Malden and, and Merton. And they brought with them aspects of printing and methods of working that wouldn't be seen till much later in the Industrial Revolution. The tomb on the right is their tomb in St. Lawrence and Malden. Now, if any one of you know your Huguenots, I am told that they're actually buried upright in this tomb. And um, so if someone knows, I'll be grateful if they could confirm that for me. Now, the next one to look at is John Affernot. Now, he may well have been of Huguenot descent, but he came to Mitcham, Fire Island. Um, now, I am told all, if you've got the name of off or not, whether it's with one T or two T's, you are all related. You all come out of one place. And they were actually related to the Mulvillians via marriage. Um, and John Avenot actually took over Ravensbury in 1755. And of course, you're probably thinking, sitting there thinking, well, what's Foundling Hospital got to, get it, to do with it? Well, Foundling Hospital, as you know, took children in. Um, and in fact, in 1760, 1761, they ended up setting, sending 16 girls to work at the Ravensbury Works. Um, now, whether they went there to work as tearers, which is quite possible, or any other function, we're not sure. Uh, but certainly with an interesting little link we found in hospital, they sent girls there to work. The picture on the right is a Ravensbury farm, which lasted well into... Uh, the latter part of the, the 1900s. Um, but in fact, John, rather than being a great printer or running the Calico Works, was actually more interested in farming. So his roots belong in this farm. Um, he was actually especially successful in, in growing madder there. Um, 
But in 1778, he actually had a lot of financial difficulties. And in fact, he got, uh, got sued by a cousin who he owed money to. He ended up actually returning to France and then eventually went back to Ireland where, it, where he died. So um, a little bit of a, a story there from that one. Now, this is the Reynolds family. The Reynolds family were, in fact, Quakers. Now, they had their roots in Chichester, but we really find them as in Southwark as cloth makers. Now, in 1751, they actually took over a works called the Willows, which is at, um, just north of Willow Lane in Mitcham. Um, and they did that from about 1720. But they moved to, Cul to the Culvers in 1779. The total estate is 280 acres. So this 55 odd acres that they had for the bleaching fields was relatively small compared to that. This is their home, Culver's Island. It was actually built by Samuel Gurin. Now Gurin actually married into the Reynolds family. Um, now, unfortunately, the Reynolds came unstuck because with the coll collapse of the over Gurney Bank in 1866, they ended up close, closing down. But if you go over into the Culver's estate, you will see names that are still associated with the family. Um, and you have Culver's Avenue, you have Reynolds Close, you have Culver's Retreat. So you will find names over there. Now, they were mainly involved with the bleaching, as I say. But if you look on this map, you'll actually see just to the top of the item, where the, the two runs of blue are, you'll see Rushy Meadow. And that's where actually the Calico works were, that was associated. But they seem to more concentrate on the bleaching than they did the Calico printing themselves. Now, the next one I'm going to, person I'm going to look at is this gentleman, Sir George Amyan. Now, he actually saw the potential in Nixon's copper plate printing. And now he formed a partnership with Nixon and we were a chap named Rucker who we'll look at in a moment. Now he was definitely a Huguenot and he was definitely from Huguenot descent, I mean, through his grandfather. He was the second son of Claudia Zamien, who was the surgeon in jet ordinary to George II. And um, George here actually, he was an MP for Dunstable. He was also a director of the East India Company. So it means he had the opportunity to bring Calico in from there. And he was made a baron in 1764 and he passed away in 1766. And in All Saints Church in Carl Shorten is this memorial to him. And it's not the big one, it's the little urn on the right hand side that is his memorial. Now, the next gentleman to look at is John Anthony Rucker. Um, he was a German Huguenot. Uh, he was actually born in Hamburg. Um, he lived from 1719 to 1804. Now he, if any of you know Strawberry Lodge, Strawberry Lodge is where we first come across Rucker um, along the River Wandle and the Wandle Valley. Um, and of course, at Butter Hill, while most of the pictures you see will be of the, the mills on the south side of the bridge, there was in fact a calico works on the north side. So it's quite likely that Rucker was actually running that calico works there. He eventually moved up to Fitz Bridge and the, the picture on the left here of uh, Wandel Villa is a house that he actually took over. He took the house over, but within the grounds, he established the calico works. Now to feed some of the water to that calico works, he actually made another cut from the River Wandel, which wasn't unusual. This was to actually feed the bleaching fields that he comes. And this is still known these days as Rucker's Cut. If you walk up from Morton Hall Park up towards Merton Abbey Mills, you actually pass the, the one link of the, the, the River Wandel, and, and you can easily miss what is known as Rucker's Cut. Uh, but he did that. He eventually moved out to Putney Bowling Green, which is, was apparently a very fashionable place. And he actually built West Hill House, which is now part of the Royal Hospital for Neurodisability. Um, and it seems that he made a considerable wealth from the sale of Nixon and Co. as well. 
I think that's where he got a lot of his money. But he obviously did and was very wealthy from working within the calico trade. Now, this is to do with Francis Nixon. Francis Nixon lived from 1705 to 1768. As I said, he was responsible for copper plate printing with Fear Philippus Thompson in Dublin. Um, printed on a, on a single colour. He was recognised by George Amyan. He went into partner with Amyan and Rucker. And his tomb, in fact, is in St. Mary's Church in, in Merton Park. Um, and you can just make out there's flowers, there's fruit, there's scrolls and there's cherubims. They're all associated with Nixon and with the work that he did. Now, the next gentleman I want to talk to, and we've got a picture of someone, right? This is William Kilburn, quite near to uh, Carl Shorten, 1745 to 1818. He was born in Dublin. He was apprentice at a Calico Works in County Kildare. And the lovely little story about him is that he used to make, draw, make drawings of, um, and do patterns and that, and he used to sell them so he could buy a pony so he could go back and visit his parents on a Sunday, which was, which was lovely. Any, anyway, he moved on. He moved to London to actually sell his designs. But he actually met this, met this person, William Curtis. Now, William Curtis actually put together a book called Flora Londinius. Now, the Flora Londinius was first published in 1777. Um, Curtis, in fact, is a botanist, and they produced this book. But all the patterns that are in there are the flowers, etc., were actually drawn by William Kilburn. And if you look at some of Kilburn's patterns, these are some of his Kilburn's patterns. Now he took over works at, at Wallington, and there is Kilburn Close up off London Road, and they actually spelled a Kilburn now for some reason with two L's. I have no reason, no knowledge of why i think personally it was a spelling mistake but uh we won't go there um but he rose rapidly in wealth and he became the most intimate printer in england um and some of his some of his work uh, cost as much as the guinea a yard which is, is a lot of money when you're thinking about the 1700s he was <coughs> excuse me he was the one who had a lot of copyright issues in fact, a London warehouse man stole his um, designs and sold them to a company, Peel & Co, in, in Bury. Um, within a short while, they were making uh, poor copies of his work. Um, Bury, of course, being part of uh, Greater Manchester, which is still today the, most, the greatest copy, uh, um, uh, greatest play for counterfeiting in the UK. Now, if you want to see his patterns, unlike William Morris that are on display at the v &A, if you want to see William Kilburn's patterns, you, you have to go and ask to actually see those patterns. Um, and they're, they're, all locked, they're all locked away and you have to ask and book appointments to go and see them. Now, the next gentleman I want to look at is this guy, uh, Henry Gardner. Now, he, was, he took over a works in Wandsworth in 1774. Now, his speciality was in patriotic subjects that appealed to the American trade. He took over the works in 1774. The American Revolution, or as some call it, the American War of Independence, was from 1775 to 1783. Now, whether Gardner was a Huguenot, we don't know. Certainly George Washington, who did a number of a, a fair bit of work for was certainly a Huguenot descent. Now, Gardner actually employed 250 hands at his Wandsworth work, and that's half as many as the rest of the Wandsworth workforce. On the right is the map of man, a rare ideological map on Calico. Now, that map is held in the British Library, as far as I know. Um, now, when they sold his works, he had over 10,000 wooden blocks and he had over 100 copper plates. 
There's still got a bit of legacy left of, of Gardner. This is Down Lodge on, on Merton Road in Wandsworth. This was his home. So he certainly had money. And um, this is at 33 Merton Road, which has now been turned into flats. He also has a memorial in also Saints Church in Wandsworth as well. And moving on, going into a, a little bit of a, what I like to think is a bit of a colourful character, um, possibly a little bit of a rogue, I don't know. Certainly someone who was successful. But you also notice that there's the chimney and the water wheel. And I said to you about our logo earlier on. Well, these were the last bits left of the Calico Works in 1945, <coughs> before they, they, they pulled them down completely. Now, this is at Willow Lane, Mitcham, and this is what was known as the Willows. And, and Makepeace was actually there from 1824, but it is said that there was possibility that the works actually existed here, or some form of works existed here from 1590. Now, Makepeace had lots of disputes over water. He wanted to do the bleaching, he needed to wash his cloth, etc. He needed water for his dyes and so, on, so forth. So he was diverting water. And that brought about lots of disputes with the other, other mills along the river. He did eventually actually put in a steam engine at one part, but he didn't only just have disputes with the other mill owners, he also, if you look him up, you'll start to find he had disputes with other businessmen. Saying all of that, he was actually very successful and he kept going in the calico trade for 25 years. Eventually, he went into culinary herbs at Figs Marsh and finally, unfortunately, ended up in, dis in um, debtor's prison. Now, the next one we're going to look at is the Littler family. Now, the Littler family, they actually took over what we now know as Merton Abbey Mills. They took that over from 1850, 1833. And um, they were actually from Waltham Abbey and from West Ham. So again, they're on the River Lee. Now, it's quite likely they were quite successful there, but they reckon they, they obviously worked out they'd be more successful if they moved down onto the River Wandle, which was a much cleaner river. And um, they produced Paisley and Art Novale des designs that were world famous. And they supplied Liberty and Co. Now, this is Edward, Edmund Littler, who was actually the chemist to the works. So he would have been responsible for deciding what the mixes were for the bleaching and what the mixes were for the dyes later on. Um, but you can see the difference in the buildings here compared to what you've got at Merton Abbey Mills now. Um, and these buildings are the original buildings. None of these buildings actually exist anymore. Um, Principally, you know, being a chemist, 20 men constantly rinsing dyed goods was, was how someone named Frederick Braithwaite explained it. The water contains sulfuric acid, alma, and other chemicals. And you can guess what? It was extremely foul. Now, his works eventually were sold to Liberty & Co., now, they took over in 1904. Now, with the greatest respect to Arthur Liberty, to my mind, he was a, he was a shopkeeper um, because he used to buy in everything. He used to get all these different designers that actually worked for him, um, and they would actually design it. He would then get they would get it printed, etc. So he was great from that, Brett, very successful, and we know Liberty & Co. still exists today. Um, but they actually end up pulling a lot of these wooden buildings that you can see in the top picture there of the site. They pulled a lot of them down. The only one that really survived was the colour house. Um, and of course, Liberty's printed for some well-known people, such as the royal family. Certainly the Queen Mother visited the site in, in uh, the 1950s, I, I or 1960s, and certainly the Queen, Princess Margaret, and the Queen Mum all had more dresses from material that had been printed at Liberty Print Works. Now, this is William Morris. William Morris, designer, poet, novelist, socialist activist, and a visionary thinker. Lead, one of the leaders of the arts and crafts movement, he revived the traditional 
British textile production. Um, and he was operating from alongside the Wandle from 1881. And the works he took over had actually been established in 1751. Um, and the works actually existed until 1940, when they were first bombed out and then taken over by Merton Bald Mills. And um, we have a large model of the works at the museum, if anyone ever visits, and it gives you a lovely picture of what his works was. Now, what's really interesting about Morris's, unlike Liberty, when they took over their site and pulled all the buildings down, you can see here how Morris loved the natural look of the buildings and actually retained them. And he kept those buildings. He also brought about better working conditions. And he also had an apprentice house on, on Merton High Street. And um, of course, for, of course, it was an apprentice house. Um, so it was for his apprentices. And certainly a lot of his apprentices that worked here went off to work elsewhere. Certainly that some of them went up to Scotland and there's a very famous print works up in Scotland um, where they where they worked. But he had some famous paintings. I'm sure if you know anything about Morris, then you know about Strawberry Thief, probably his most famous piece of work. Everybody loves Strawberry Thief. But of course, all of these are based on nature from Morris. And um, Strawberry Thief actually came about because he was sitting in his garden in Kelscott House and he was watching the actual birds taking his strawberries and he came up with that pattern. Um, details of the forest, very small snapshot of what is a very big pattern. And of course, the other one he came up with, he loved these rivers. We've already seen Cray and where he did the Cray River. This is his Wandle pattern. Um, a couple of my colleagues don't like this one. The reason they don't like it is because of the colours, the fact that it's red and it's not blue. Uh, they believe a river should be blue and they're probably right in one way. Um, and some people liken this to a, a barber's pole um, as such. But, it, you know, they're just some of his patterns, but they are amazing. They're produced on cloth. They were produced as wallpapers, etc. Now, if you ever get a hand block printed Morris paper, um, which you can do, the blocks they use for making wallpaper are actually four times the size of the blocks they use for printing textiles. Now, this is the uh, Starry family. Now, this is where I said to you about Croydon Old Palace and the river coming through Croydon. If you look on the left-hand picture, this is the river Wandle at Croydon Old Palace. Um, the Starry family took it over. They, there was actually three works there. Samuel, Samuel Starry started it off first. Um, and he was there from 1796, the family, till 1886. Uh, even went bankrupt the family at one point in 1831, but somehow they kept going. Um, the first Samuel Starry's son, also Samuel, actually ended up being a coal merchant um, in London. But the other son, Thomas, actually formed a partnership with a John Oswald um, and his son. Now on the right is the Great Hall. Um, and if you can imagine this, this is a palace that was built around the time of Henry VIII Henry VIII is apparently said he hated going to Croydon because he all, was always ill when he went to Croydon. Um, but certainly you can see here how the Great Hall is actually being used as a bleaching field. You can see the cloth actually hanging from the rafters there um, in, in what is a drying shed. Um, I would recommend if you're interested in this and learning more about Croydon Old Palace and how it was used as a, a wash house, if you like, I recommend you get from Palace to Wash House by Lillian Thornhill, and that you can get from the Friends of Croydon Old Palace. Now that more or less brings us to the close to this talk. And um, I hope I've interested you by talking about some of the characters in there, some of the methods they use, and um, etc. There's other people I could have talked about. There's James Half Half High, who moved from. Crayford, who took over the, the Morris work, George and Jovis Ansel, who were journeyman printers. They would have come and they would have done their, they'd come in, done a particular job run, and then gone on to somewhere else. J 
James Newton, when you look at records of Calico Princess, he was involved with a number of different people along the river, including William Kilburn. William Aspey, Aspray is what I've mentioned. Thomas Marler, he now has apparently has a high stone tomb in a Beddington churchyard. And I would imagine that is in fact St. Mary's. And there's also a, a, a chap from Summers Town, Calico Print Words, called James Raglan. And his pictures are all saved and within the National Archive at Kew. So that's the uh, conclusion of this presentation. Um, I'll leave that up just for a second. So if anybody wants to have a look at uh, our email address, if you think of any questions after the presentation's finished, don't be afraid to email us and we'll be quite happy to come back and give you the answer.